introduce uh, Professor Christos Septimiopoulos uh, from the Academy of Athens. Uh, he will speak about restaurant adiabatic invariance as a topic behavior and applications. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, the invitation. And it is always a pleasure to return to this group. Um, this is going to be a seminar, and probably the people know already that there are going to be another three sort of lectures, like a small course on normal form theory. Uh, the truth is that today I'm going to speak about normal forms, but some technical points I will not explain in every detail. So let's say I will not explain from scratch. I will probably assume, but please, for the at least for the younger people, don't get disappointed by this, because if you want to know more in, in, on a more, let's say, basic form, there is going to be a whole series of lectures to follow this week and next week as well. Uh, now, I come to the subject, uh, resonant adiabatic invariance. I should probably first start with explaining a little the word adiabatic in general, an adiabatic problem is a problem where we have one small frequency. We have a slow modulation, let's say, of the system. Okay, and uh, uh, they appear in many, many areas of physics, and among these areas are those that are of particular interest for us, like celestial mechanics. In celestial mechanics, we have mean motion, let's say, frequencies of the order of unity. The planets move with the order of a few years. But the, let's say the perihelia of the planets, or the lines of node of the planets, have secular frequencies of precession. And these are much slower. They are of the order of the mass parameters new themselves, so they are much slower there of the orders, the periods are of the orders of thousands of years, or tens of thousands of years. So we have small one small frequency or more small frequencies and some fast ones. In astral dynamics you have something quite similar. A satellite has a very, very, let's say, small period of of the orbit, but you can have again a very, very slow precession, so a very small frequency of precession. The problem that we will study though, though related to astral dynamics again, comes from a different area, which is the motion of charged particles in, for example, stars in the magnetospheres of stars or planets, and also in artificial magnetic bottles, as we call them, which are machines that were created starting from the 50s or the 60s with the aim to confine plasma inside. So the magnetospheres of astrophysical objects are natural magnetic bottles and there are also artificial ones. So what do we have? The most famous example are the Earth Van Allen zones or Van Allen belts. They are belts of charged particles, the inner belt consists mainly of electrons and protons, the outer belt contains mostly electrons. And the electrons are doing a sort of mirror, as we call it, motion. They are gyrating, of course, around the magnetic lines, but in addition to the gyration, they are going from one pole to the other, and they are oscillating between the poles. Now, this the same phenomenon is repeated in a different structure which is formed, for example, in the Earth's magnetosphere. The Earth's magnetosphere is a dipole very close to the Earth, but if you go to larger distances, you encounter, uh, let's say, the interaction between the magnetic field of the Earth and the magnetic field coming from together with the solar wind. And all that creates in the, in, let's say, in the tail, as we call it, the magnetotail, you, you create a sort of current sheet, you create an area of reversal of the magnetic field lines. And here again, you have magnetic bottle effects of particles that have been the subject of research at least for three decades. Now, I was, uh, I would like, I was impressed to see that in Wikipedia, so I 
we usually don't like very much Wikipedia because we think it's not very scientific. Well, Alessandra has Scholarpedia uh, as a substitute. But the truth is that this sentence I encountered in Wikipedia was impressed. In the inner belt, the particles are trapped and so on, gyrate and move along field lines. The particles encounter regions of larger density of magnetic field line. Their longitudinal velocity is low and can be reversed, reflecting the particle. This causes the particles to bounce back, and there is a reference. And the motion of these trapped particles is chaotic. Other reference. So the, the point is that these motions are not necessarily regular altogether. I mean, we have a diabatic invariance, we have approximate integrals of motion, we have regular orbits, but we also have chaotic orbits. We have some limits of applicability of this adiabatic invariance. So we're going to talk about these issues a little later. So what's a magnetic bottle? I created a small, let's say, toy uh, scheme of that. You can assume a magnetic field configuration. Assume this is axisymmetric. There is an axis of symmetry which is horizontal here in this plot. You have a main magnetic field component here. And you have also a magnetic field component that reverses the sign in the, in the cylindrical radial direction. So here it goes downwards. On the other side, it goes upwards. So what you can see here is just the configuration of the magnetic field lines. It resembles truly a bottle. Okay, so this can be considered to be the necks of the bottle. Now, how does it work? Why does it confine the particles? Or why does it make the particles oscillate around? If you put the particles just on the equator, they, without any velocity in the z direction, they will just gyrate around the magnetic field lines. And this is high school information that the, the so-called uh, uh, cyclotron right, uh, frequency, or the gyro frequency, is just given in terms of the magnetic field, the, the charge of the particle divided by the mass. And also, we have a quantity, the gyro radius, the radius of the circle which depends also on the velocity of the gyration. Okay, that's very elementary. Now, what will happen if you just push the particle a little away from this central plane, you just give some velocity. We know that, first of all, again, from high school knowledge, that this velocity, if the magnetic field was uniform, this velocity doesn't play any role. I mean, the motion continues to be helical. You have a gyration and a uniform motion around. But here now, what will happen is that you also have this component of the magnetic field, which is small in general compared to this one. But it has the property of being larger here and smaller here. Because the angle of the magnetic lines, as you can see, is bigger here than, than here. So here we have a relatively big value of B, B rho. Let's say here we have a small value. If you just go back to the basic plot now, if you just view this thing on the other side again, you just take the, the three, three fingers rule that we learned in high school, you can discover that this component of the magnetic field will cause a force, a force that, well, in this plot, you can see it looks towards the audience. If I return to this plot, this force is backwards on this direction. For the this is for the positive charged particle, but essentially the same figure is repeated with reverse senses for the negative charged particle. And on the other side, the force is towards the positive z direction. So you have a negative force here, a positive force here. But this is bigger than this because beta b rho, which is responsible for it, is bigger on the upper side than on the lower side. So there is a net delta f, let's say, a net force which looks backwards. So this is like a restoring force. This is like a spring force. If you evaluate 
the, the change of this force per unit length as you move towards the Z axis, you can discover then that there is a second frequency created. So the particle that you injected it in this way will try to return in this direction when it passes from the other side, you have to repeat the exercise. Now B row looks up towards you repeat the exercise, you see again it is a restoring force bringing it back. So eventually the particle just oscillates. So in addition to the gyration, you have an oscillation with a second frequency. So you just created a second frequency by this configuration, hence the name, magnetic bottom. Now, this is a true case. This is a magnetic bottle configuration. This, the, you have to be a little careful. You cannot put any type of magnetic field that you want because it has to come according to Maxwell's laws from some vector potential. But you can easily find uh, magnetic bottle configurations. The magnetic lines look more or less like before. Now I reverse the clock 90 degrees. The z-axis is upright. And here you see a true numerically computed orbit of a charged particle. The red one, you can see, does gyration, several types of gyrations, but in the same time it oscillates up and down in this plot. Okay? So how do we study this oscillation? Is it a regular orbit? Is it a chaotic one? Well, in dynamical systems, we learn to use Poincaré surfaces of section. So here, a natural choice of section is every time when the particle, for example, crosses the axis, this one, the vertical axis, rho equal to zero, with a velocity that has a particular sense, positive or negative, let's say positive. When you do that, you obtain a surface of section, a form of phase portrait, and you can see that very, very close to the center, we have many orbits that are regular, so they form invariant curves. Out to, if we move outwards, we have chaotic orbits. But for other values of the energy, we also have some regular, or chaotic in other cases, resonant orbits that form also some islands of resonance. And we'll come to that, because actually this is the main thing. And uh, well, for those orbits, which are the simplest form of regular ones, we have approximate integrals of motion conserved, and these integrals, one can show that they correspond to a quantity which in physics is known as the magnetic dipole moment, which gives the response of a particle to a dipole magnetic field. So essentially, our effort is to characterize these integrals. We are going to speak about the mathematical method, essentially, by which we are able to obtain, well, these curves first, and these ones that correspond to the resonances, that's the new thing, because this theory of adiabatic invariance is uh, well known, actually. It has been established at least in the last 50 years or more. OK. So we will work in the Hamiltonian formalism for many reasons. First of all, because we like it, we know it, we understand it. And probably not only as a matter of taste, but also as a matter of convenience. Because when we work with the Hamiltonian formalism, we can do that nice machinery of, that is called canonical transformations. We can, instead of dealing with the equations of motion directly, we can implement transformations on the variables that apply to the Hamiltonian itself, to the generating function of the equations of motion. And that's very convenient. So now you take, in the previous model that I was presenting, you take the magnetic field, you compute the vector potential corresponding to it, and one basic result of electrodynamics is that the Hamiltonian yielding the motion of particles given by this form is not just the momentum square, but it is the momentum plus the vector potential square. And that quantity comes from the fact, if you just made a little calculus on that, you will see that essentially it means that the magnetic field always leaves the modulus of the velocity constant, the measure of the velocity constant. And that's because the Laplace force that goes with it is always perpendicular to the velocity. 
So it can only change the orientation, it cannot change the modulus of the lattice. So this fact is expressed in the arrangement of the terms in the Hamiltonian like this one. If you make the particular computation for the model I was presenting to you before, uh, you get a Hamiltonian of this form. This V here appears like a potential, but that's only an artifact of expressing <coughs> the terms quadratic in A square. It's nothing more than the colloidal component of the vector potential square. I, I will not enter into that. Anyway, the main thing that appears here, which is basic in all these problems of adiabatic invariance, is the following. The form of the Hamiltonian always results in an oscillator degree of freedom, which represents the gyration. This is very generic, plus something that looks like a simple uniform motion. So there is, in the basic form, in the lowest order terms of the Hamiltonian, there is no second frequency. And this fact means that when you try to implement perturbation theory here, you start with something fundamental, the lack of a frequency that allows you essentially to introduce, let's say, good action under variables and so on, all the things that we usually do when we have oscillations. In the basic form of the Hamiltonian, the frequency is missing. It is zero. In problems of celestial mechanics, if it is not zero exactly, it would be uh, let's say epsilon or mu, but that is again essentially of higher order. It is not in the kernel of your perturbation theory problem. So the main question is how to deal with this. Essentially, the non-resonant adiabatic theory deals with this particular form of the Hamiltonian, and uh, the resonant comes as a as a as an extra thing to consider afterwards. So I will try to uh, to speak first about non-resonant the theory. The non-resonant theory is very interesting. Uh, again, we see here we start with the Hamiltonian, and for the gyration, for the oscillatory degree of freedom, we can introduce action angle variables, as we always do for oscillators. And this J1, this action. It represents again the magnetic moment of the electron. So it is just a reformulation, this action variable of the of the magnetic dipole moment. So if you just write your Hamiltonian, uh, the machinery of perturbation theory is to try to make canonical transformations that will pass from this all variables that are the pair of action angle variables for the oscillatory degree of freedom, but for the rest, we just keep what it was before. We don't, we don't, we didn't make anything like that for the second degree of freedom that had no frequency. So these are the old variables. Uh, we try to pass to new canonical variables so that the Hamiltonian is brought in a form that, as always in perturbation theory, contains two parts. One part is the so-called normal form. So the normal form is, let's say, the part of the Hamiltonian that has now some nice symmetry properties, probably, or is easier to analyze, or easier to unravel its dynamics. So the whole effort of canonical perturbation theories by making this change of variables to write the Hamiltonian in a way that this part, the normal form, is a good part that has good properties that are easier to analyze than in the original Hamiltonian. But this process also generates a second part, which is called the remainder, which is usually something small. It can be very small. And it only introduces a small modification with respect to the normal form dynamics. So you can say that my dynamics is essentially given by what will be dictated here by z, by the normal form, but there will also be some modifications that are all quantified in the terms of the remainder. Now, what is the structure of the normal form for the particular example we studied? We try, first of all, to make the gyration 
degree of freedom explicitly integrable like a, an oscillator. So we have just give, give it the form of an exact oscillator. But we also try to generate the second frequency. We try to, to give the normal form uh, a, a particular structure so that the, the second frequency, which is the coefficient before the quadratic term in zeta here, with zeta is just a near identity transformation of z, the variable, the axial, the vari axial variable. So we are trying to give the normal form this shape, and this means that the second frequency depends on the magnetic moment of the electron. So it is not a constant in our problem any longer. It is. It depends, the value of the second frequency will depend somehow on how fast, essentially, the electron gyrates. So the magnetic bottle has this property. The more energetic particles have larger values of the second frequency as well the less energetic particles have smaller values of the second frequency. If you had the particle moving along the axis the, without any gyration, the particle would just escape from the neck of the bottle without doing anything. So you have to give a certain amount of gyration energy to make it also reflect. Now, let's try to make it a little more specific. Now, I, I, uh, this is the part that I ask, in particular, the people that are not acquainted with normal forms not to be very disappointed, but, well, there has to be some technicalities also. Uh, instead of axonandry variables in, let's say, a polynomial treatment, we can use some equivalent, essentially, complex canonical variables. This is very standard in perturbation theory. Again, the, this we can only do for the gyration degree of freedom and the basic Hamiltonian will look like an oscillator in this complex canonical variables plus something that has no second frequency. Now, the thing that uh, I like to use as a term in recent years is called bookkeeping. Bookkeeping means that your total Hamiltonian contains this part but also higher order parts. And these higher order parts are of different orders of smallness. Your, your Hamiltonian has one or more small parameters. Here you could imagine the small parameter could just be the value of the polynomial variables themselves, but you could also have a coupling constant that is small. You can have several things that are small. You can reorganize your Hamiltonian. So instead of just, uh, uh, let's say, choosing a very, very fixed rule, you just create yourself a path in parameter space. You just say, I take from this I mean, for some criteria that you, you, impl you impose yourself, you choose yourself, you just take one part of the Hamiltonian and you say, I think this part is of first order of smallness. You call it first order of smallness. It contains some terms. The next part of the Hamiltonian, I call it second order of smallness for some criteria again. So you just put a, 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 a quantity in front, you call it lambda, Lambda has the numerical value equal to one. So lambda is nothing, does nothing, adds nothing to the to the story. But this lambda here means that this part of the Hamiltonian is first order of smallness. Then you put a lambda square, means second order of smallness. And then you carry on the symbol with you. Either you do it, this is in particular very convenient when you write computer algebraic problem, programs as we do now that we make high-order expansions of normal forms using uh, computer programs. So in these computer programs, you keep that lambda, you carry it with you. This lambda resumes your choice of what is smallness. And in the end of the process, you just give it back the value lambda equal to 1, and you forget altogether about it. So uh, here, in this Let's say in the example of the Hamiltonian that we were considering before, the simplest normalization scheme for the non-resonant adiabatic invariant is just to go with polynomial degrees, like usually. 
but we will change that in the resonant construction. So in the non-resonant construction, we just essentially we just choose lambda to represent the polynomial degree. Then in normal form theory, you have to do also, always also something else. You have to say a normal form theory is a theory that tries to give the Hamiltonian a particular form. This form has to contain some terms and to eliminate others that are not of the form that we like. So we do a thing called, we choose a resonant module. We say, we choose a rule by which we say which terms we want to keep and which terms we want to keep. And the terms that we want to keep in the, in the adiabatic invariants are a little different from the terms that we keep in the usual normal form theory. So let's say we keep the terms of the form of polynomials of this type for which we have powers of the product Q1, P1, that means powers of I1, the axiom, only. So this means to eliminate the angles. But for the other degree of freedom, we just want to have anything like Q2, the second variable, raised to some power. That's more than enough, because if you do that, essentially, you're going to end up with the Hamiltonian that is, uh, let's say, integrable again. And it will look like a system of one degree of freedom. I will show the form of that Hamiltonian in one transparency. But let's see now, this is probably the most technical part, the difference between this, let's say, choice of normalization in the previous one is that when you, in all forms of canonical perturbation theory, you need a thing called the homological equation. So you have to write some uh, generating functions that you compute by a rule. And this rule, usually we write in a convenient form, which is diagonal. So in the usual theory means that if, I, if in my expression, I have a monomial of a particular form, I add in my generating function a monomial of the same form, the same exponents, and then I just regulate the coefficients so that this monomial disappears, for example, from the normal form. But here you cannot do that. And the reason you cannot do it is because your operator that is doing the business contains a term P2 squared. So that I may write on the blackboard to make it explicit. If I have, let's say, I omega 1 Q1 P1 plus P2 squared over 2 uh, acting on something, and this I want to make it something else, which I may call it let's say h. So let's say you have to solve an equation of this type. So if this contains a monomial q1 raised to the power kappa 1, p1, lambda 1, q2, k2, p2, lambda 2, you try to implement the Poisson bracket for getting, so this is your unknown quantity, this is a known quantity. But if you make the Poisson bracket, you will see here this term will generate an extra power of P2. So this is going to generate the term P2 to the lambda square plus 1. But it will also generate uh, one power less in Q2. So it will not generate the same monomial like you had before. But there will be a change of the exponents. That's exactly what I, I have written here. So it will generate this thing. And this means that these homological equations that we use in perturbation theory cannot be solved term by term. So you cannot just compare the coefficients divided by a small divisor and, and get the result. So how do we do it? The solution is to group together some terms and solve for all of them together. This doesn't mean that you cannot solve, I mean, the homological equation, after all, is a partial differential equation. I mean, you are always being supposed to, to be able to solve it. The only question is if you can do it easily or more difficult. So here, what happens is the following. If I group together 
let's say, all the terms of ascending and descending powers for the second variable. So let's say, to give a specific example, assume I had a term of order A that was just Q1, P1 squared. And now I have five power left, if it is a term of order A. I assemble together all the terms of the form Q2 raised to the fifth power, Q2 fourth power, P2 raised to the first power, and so on, up to the term Q2, P2 raised to the fourth power, and P2 raised to the fifth power. So these terms, I solve the homological equation Together, I create a linear system for the unknown coefficients of these terms in terms of the known coefficients of the same terms in the right-hand side of the homological equation. So this system now, this, this system is not linear, it is not diagonal, but it has, besides the diagonal, just one more super uh, line above the diagonal. So it can essentially be solved by back substitution again. The last equation can be solved directly, then you substitute it to the previous one, you solve this one, you substitute everything to the previous one, you solve the previous one, and so on. Like a chain, you determine the form of the solution. So this is just the, non, the classical non-resonant construction that allows you to determine the generating functions of canonical transformations, bringing your problem to an adiabatic normal. Here is an example. In the previous model that generates the term, let's say this is the form of the, of the final Hamiltonian, the normal form. Look, it has I1, powers of I1. And otherwise, it is a system of uh, P2 and Q2. They are there. 1 over 2 P2 squared. This is the kinetic term. We had it before. And also we have q2 squared, q2 to the fourth power, q2 to the sixth power, and so on. So if you think about it physically now, if I consider i1 to have a specific value to be an integral, it is just in one degree of freedom Hamiltonian. It contains a kinetic term, it contains i1 as a parameter, and then it contains q2. Now, how well does it perform? If you back transform to the original variables this quantity, i1, you re-express everything in terms of the original variables, you compute level curves of that. And these are the red curves that you can see here. And you see how nicely they fit the domain of regular motion. So essentially, this quantity, which is found by the back transformation of this quantity here, represents the form the, the value of the magnetic dipole moment of the electron for the orbits that are doing this regular mirror oscillation. So of course, the integral fails completely. We can see it already here. It still fails when we meet resonances, and it fails completely when we go out of the chaotic scene. I have a question before you go on, please. Yes. Uh, you're using this term adiabatic, uh, I guess, yes. because uh, uh, you make the normal form in such a way that uh, you cannot remove completely uh, the dependence upon the angles uh, uh, we in the um, z, p, z variables. Uh, that is, you cannot transform to action angle variables in z, p, z. For the moment. For the, okay. And you have something which depends the frequency in that case, which depends on the action. other, bar, the other yeah. action. Yeah. Uh, okay, but uh, in any case, everything is still uh, conservative. Absolutely. Okay, because uh, I'm used to to, term, to use the term adiabatic when you have uh, something okay. which slowly varies with uh, uh, Yeah, with well, time. that is a, a different... If you have, let's say, a general Hamiltonian, I mean, uh, this use that you refer to, I guess, is the following. You can have, let's say, a Hamiltonian, which has Q, P, and the quantity epsilon times T. Yeah. So this is let's say, the most general form of an adiabatic problem. So we have an explicit dependence of time. And this dependence now can or cannot, cannot, does not necessarily have to be periodic. 
So if I have a problem, uh, a problem in which I have only periodic dependence, like the classical example of Einstein, we have the pendulum, modulated pendulum that we increase and decrease the length uh, little by little. So let's say in this model, if I if I only have terms of the form cosine of epsilon t and so on, this problem can be brought in the form that I was speaking before. Because I will just introduce, let's say, a dummy action with a small epsilon in front, and that I will consider a higher order. On the other hand, if this, if there is something non-periodic, if it is not a small frequency, but it is just a very slow modulation of time, nothing of this applies. Yes. Uh, but in any case, uh, if you uh, neglect uh, higher order time, so you have that uh, I1 is constant, I1 is constant. So uh, this means that uh, omega 2 of I1 is constant. Huh? Yes, okay. it means that for every label value of I1, we have a particular value of omega 2. And that fact we are going to exploit now for the resonant construction. This so remark this is means constant. that in that case, uh, you can construct uh, actual yeah. variables for the harmonic oscillator. That is correct. Values. And this is precisely actually what we are going to do. I mean, after, but it has to be understood that this can be done only after you realize that construction, because after you do this, after you have that construction, only then you're able to say what is omega 2. So here, omega 2 is just, I collect all the coefficients in terms of, in front of q2 squared. So you first have to go through the construction that we just described, and after that, you have your coefficient in front of q2 squared, so you have your second frequency, and then you can do what you were speaking about. So now I pass to the key point. How do we deal? Well, first of all, all this is known that I told you, but it's not a new result. But now I want to speak about how to deal with resonances. So here you see resonances. First of all, it has to be understood that since omega 2 is a polynomial of the action, we have to say it's a small thing. We said it was zero at uh, zero order, and it only became important at higher orders of speculation theory. So we, we expect it in general to be small. If it is small, resonances will not be very important. So let's say if it is one hundredth of omega one, we probably have a resonance of one over one hundred. That's not so big a difference. But the truth is that when you push those things to higher and higher values of the, of the magnetic moment, you find out that you can encounter quite low order resonances. So you can make omega 2 being 1 over 4 of omega 1, 1 over 3, 1 over 2 even, and yet having many regular motions. So this is precisely the example here. Here you can see four islands, but actually the resonance in this example is 1 over 2. So you have just two pairs of non-communicating islands. The points, the part, the, the intersection, the particles go from here to here and here, back and forth. And here they go from here to there, back and forth. And there is no communication. Here again, you can see six islands of stability. It is, an, it is 1 over 3 resonance. The resonance is again double. So from here you go there and there and so on. Now, all the resonances bifurcate from the center. So it means as you increase the energy, you increase the value of I1, you increase the value of omega 2, you generate the resonance. The, gen the resonance, when it is generated, it appears in the center. From the center, it moves outwards like a big of chain, essentially, until it reaches the chaotic domain. Now, the first thing you can do already with non-resonant adiabatic theories to determine the bifurcation energy. You can say at what value of the gyration energy, essentially, this fact will happen. And this you do it in the following way. You just say, if I am in the center, I have Q2 equal to P2 equal to zero. So I am left with a quantity depending only on I1. In the center, the 
you are left with an expression for the normal form, which actually you equate to your energy. Because the numerical value of the normal form still keeps being just the numerical value of the Hamiltonian, which is the energy. And just this now depends on I1. You can use this quantity to estimate by the usual Hamilton equation the value of omega 1. And you can use it, like we said before, by the coefficient of the quadratic term in Q2 to know omega 2. So now if you just go there and solve for this equation, all these are computed quantities now, you can determine this is for any resonance of the form m1 over m2, you can determine at which value of the axiom this uh, resonance will appear, will bifurcate. And after you know that, you will return here and you will find also at what value of the energy this will have. And the result is extremely accurate with several uh, numerical digits. So you just know where the resonance bifurcates. Yes, please. Uh, um, why do you say that this gives uh, the value of I1 at which uh, you have bifurcation? This gives uh, the value of I1 at which you have uh, the resonance. The resonance bifurcating in the center because the crucial assumption was that in order to have an expression like this, I set Q2 equal to P2 equal to 0. So in general, if I go, let's say, in the previous expression here, uh, this is the form of the normal form. So if I am at the Q2 equal to P2, or, or no, Q2 different from 0, P2 different from 0, I still cannot say that the partial derivative of Z with respect to uh, I1 will give me omega 1 before I re-express everything in action angle variables in the second variable, like you were asking me to do before. But for the bifurcation point, I don't really need to make this second pass into action angle variables because in the center, in particular, all these quantities Q2, P2 are going to be equal to zero. So I'm left with an expression of uh, depending on I1 only. And if I take that expression and I put it here, I get the value of omega 1 for those orbits precisely. So this is the gyration frequency of the equatorial orbits, essentially, of the orbits that are in the limits of infinitesimally small oscillations around the equatorial plane. So for this mechanism allows me just to compute the value of the energy or the action where we have the central bifurcation. Of course, it will tell me nothing, let's say in this plot, about the value of I1 star at the particular position where the resonance lies now in this plot. Okay? This refers only to the bifurcation point. Okay? Well, and now I come to the crucial point. But, but yeah, yeah. sorry, uh, going back again yes. to the previous slide, uh, the second condition is still for the same value of the energy. You didn't ch you do not change the value of the energy when you compute the value. No, no, the plot is not, this plot does not correspond to the bifurcation energy. Okay. It is a little afterwards. At the, at the bifurcation energy exactly, this islands have all just shrunk, gone straight to, the, to zero. So maybe there is a little bit of confusion about the terminology. Yes. What you mean by resonance bifurcates here is in fact that secondary, the appearance of secondary resonance is around the main one, the central one. It's the appearance of all the secondary resonances happens in the center. So, so yeah. if they yeah. are truly bifurcated. It, it, it yeah. means that uh, the linearized motion the linearized around, motion the, the, around the center around the center show up the, the set frequency omega, omega, the set omega 2 yeah. and this but is in the fact computation this is what I said before it is an infinitesimal oscillation around the equatorial orbit so if okay. I was strictly on the equatorial orbit q2 equal p2 equal to 0 there would be no oscillation in fact but if I am infinitesimally close to it, the oscillation is just given in this expression here by the quadratic coefficient. And this result becomes now exact because the linearized equations of motion doesn't allow me for anything else. And, and, and another key point, yeah. sorry, 
can, can you go sure. back? Another key point is that omega 2 is from some values on. On. Because, okay. if because, because you can, it is a, a, a frequency related to an oscillator, uh, an harmonic oscillator. So, they, they cannot be negative or they cannot be uh, corresponding to negative values of the edge. Just to make it uh, short, let's say the, the, the expression, if you go just here, you go back to the previous transparency, the, the lowest order contribution to omega 2 is just 0 0.5 by 1, square root of that. Yeah. Tap 2 times this square root. So essentially it is the square root of I1. Omega 2 in this example is just the square root of I1. So the value of omega 2 changes with the value of I1. If I have a very small gyration, I will also have a very small omega 2. So if I want to have a particular, on the other hand, omega 1, will not be very different from one always in this example. So it will be one plus some corrections. So as I move on the, let's say, resonance condition, if I have some low order integers here, this quantity is going to be essentially always close to one, and this quantity is always being close to the square root of I1. So if I want the largest, the value of I1, the smallest the integers that I can have for generating the resonance, so it means that the resonance will appear at a particular value and it will continue to exist from that value on. And that is precisely what I mean by the use of the term verification. Uh, excuse me, another, another thing. The E star is the value of the energy at which the families of new periodic orbits by Exactly. But you have two families there. Stable and unstable, but they come out together. No, but uh, they are both stable. <coughs> In your plot, you no, you have stable. Yes. You mean this and no, this? No, no, no. You have uh, four uh, islands. Yeah, between you have the unstable ones. Yes, yes, but you have four islands. So no, they do this. You can show essentially that although they are not connected, they yes, bifurcate at the same value. Yes, but yeah. no. What I'm saying is that they are two families. Two families. So the, the my point is that they bifurcate together. Together. Ah, exactly. So this is, this is a topological property actually of the Hamiltonian. I mean, when so you have these double chains instead of single yes, chains. Yes, but yeah. it's not usual. <coughs> to not very usual, but for the lower the resonances like 1 over 2, 1 over 3, 1 over 4, this can happen. I mean, actually, in basic books like Arnold, for example, in the appendix of Arnold books, so you have the explicit conditions where you so, have this okay, double no, pairing. Yeah. So E star is the value of the bifurcation energy for both families. For both families. And for their stable and unstable counterparts of both. The whole face portrait goes from the center at the same value of the energy. So now, let's say that was for the bifurcation energy, but now I move a little above that. So I go to a value of the energy above the bifurcation one, and now I have a nicely developed phase portrait, and I want to be able to speak about the adiabatic invariance in this uh, vicinity of the resonances. And here comes the crucial point. So I, I, what I do here, I like to see like a combination of a term that I learned actually here in Roma by Giuseppe, the, the term detuning. So what it means is the following. If you change the energy a little now, so that your resonance goes on, the values of omega 1 star and omega 2 star that you can always compute are not going to be exactly resonant. They are going to be close to resonant. That's one thing. On the other hand, your zeroth order Hamiltonian doesn't contain the second uh, term altogether. Doesn't contain the term 1 over 2 omega 2 squared, lambda squared. So what I do is the following. I add it, this term, and I subtract it by hand. For, the, for omega 1, I add and I subtract the difference from the exact resonance. This is the detuning part. 
For omega 2, I add and I subtract the term all together. After all, omega 2 was supposed to be a difference from zero. So in the end, if you think about that, that's also a detuning, the basic value of the frequency being zero. So I add, if, if this is omega 1 star, I add something and I subtract something. But now look what happens. I add it, I well, this is your base Hamiltonian. I subtract the term, I add something else. This is a new thing that has been added. And here it is subtracted, but here I call it all than one. So let's say this is a, a sort of fooling ourselves. We, we just add it and say it's order zero. Then we subtract it again and we say it's order one. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, lambda in the end, if you recall, is just one. So that nothing changed, really. But in fact, this is the essence of the tuning, is to say, OK, a small difference from a frequency is just another small parameter. Just carry it on to higher order, like a small parameter. Here, my small parameter, all the small parameters, I gather them together. I call them, I put a lambda in front. Second frequency, I add. This term was missing in the original Hamiltonian. I know how much is this value now because I implemented. So I add it. And then I subtract it again. But here that I subtract it, I call it order one smallness. Here where I add it, I call it order zero smallness. It's just a mathematical game. So, yes. Is, it, so, is this the same of the, the translation of the frequencies of the tones to me? I mean, it, it, it sounds like, I mean, you, you focus yes. on a different frequency and you are trying to construct a normal form this about an object characterized by that frequency. The different, there is no a small difference though. In the, if you speak about the Kolmogorov, let's say, construction, for example, okay, this, set, this, let's say, shift of the frequency, you're always to keep by exploding the Hessian of the, of the yeah. non-zero part of the Hessian. Yeah. Okay? Here, you don't have that. But this is not very important for the perturbation scheme. So formally, there is also a small difference. Uh, ideologically, if you want, it's quite similar. So now I came to the point that Alessandra was asking me. I created my second frequency, and I am free to uh, write axon angle variables or complex polynomial canonical variables for the second degree. Sorry, with a different bookkeeping? With a different thing? bookkeeping now. It has to be noted already that this bookkeeping means that at order lambda, I have some terms of second degree, while in the previous scheme, the terms of order lambda contained only terms of fourth degree, because it was going with polynomial degree. Here, it does no longer go with polynomial degree. The terms actually of order lambda to some power contain everything from quadratic terms up to that power. And that will continue to subsequent applications of perturbation theory. But that, that for the computer, this is not a problem, because for the computer, I don't care if I have something which is of second degree. Of course, when I see the perturbations, I might be terrified, oh my god, I didn't get rid of the terms of second degree. But actually, if you measure all together, all the things together, the whole thing with the pluses and the minus is small. So it is only formally of second degree. The true quantity, the size of the quantity is small. And this is reflected here. So then I just do the usual resonant theory. I choose a resonant module that allows me to keep in the Hamiltonian the resonant terms and to get rid of all the terms that are non-resonant. Again, I am sorry for the people that probably will not understand exactly what this means. And I compute resonant integrals. And then I back transform. And if you do it, you see that you are able to get the resonances very well. This is a development of order 6. 
for B1 over 3 resonance. This is a development of order 6, I think, again, in this plot for B1 over 2 resonance. So this is essentially the computation of resonant and hepatic invariance. I mean, essentially, after you engineer your Hamiltonian, you have to do nothing else. You just put everything in your usual normalization scheme, and you just compute generating functions by the usual rule. You only broke a little this polynomial degree rule, but that's not important in any way. Asymptotic behavior. Now, there were some claims of people. Yeah. This refers to. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. And, you, and are you able also to compute the bifurcation? Of course. Of course. I mean, you compute the whole family from the moment. Actually, the bifurcation yeah, energy you have already computed, yeah. but you compute the whole story of the family up to where it goes to the chaotic domain. And how is the comparison with the Excellent. Excellent. We speak always about several digits. Uh, of course, and, and this and goes, uh, essentially this information is in this plot. Here you have the, the difference between the theoretical and the numerical solution is always quantified in the value of the remainder. The remainder is a quantity uh, that can be as low as 10 to the minus, the, I, I think this is the, the base 10 logarithm. 10 to the minus 30, of course, if you go to very high values of the energy, you only have five significant figures. But if you are to low values of the energy, you can reach something like 50 significant figures. Now, it is interesting to note that uh, some people working on the non-resonant normal forms uh, claim that there are three regimes, uh, the asymptotic one, you can see here, but also the convergent one and the divergent one. The truth is there is no convergent or divergent regimes for either the non-resonant or the non-resonant construction. If this plot, if you continue to a higher normalization order, always turns upside down. So the remainder, eventually your process is diverging. There is no doubt about this. Uh, you cannot very easily uh, see it in the form of divisors because the equations that you were solving was something like a huge determinant times a column is equal to a column but this determinant contains already powers of the normalization scheme so essentially you recover the usual factorials that we have in the asymptotic estimates of this method so the fact that you are dealing with a determinant instead of a small divisor is not by itself extremely important and I will close with what goes beyond the domain of applicability. First of all, this is, it, it, this is interesting. This is a little off the line. But uh, the central orbit, here you can see the, the stability, the non stability index of the central orbit, the periodic orbit. So it's stable. Up to the point, up to a point at an energy about 0 0.30 something, where it crosses the value of 2 for the first time. So here the plot is from 0 to, no, 0 to 1, or so, no, so 0 to 1. So it goes, it starts from 1. So here you have the first crossing of the stability boundary. So the orbit becomes unstable, but for this particular orbit, you can see that the, the history of the bifurcations that go on from that point on is not the one of period doubling. So you don't have period doubling and so on. Actually, the first bifurcation appears since the Hennon index is one, it means that there appears in a, in a single period family. Okay? And you can predict that value up to this point, you can predict it by the normal form if you ask for the bifurcation energy of the one-to-one -one family. So omega-2 equal to omega-1, which corresponds to a Hernon index equal to 1. So from that point on, the normal form really collapses over here because the periodic orbit becomes unstable and then very, very close to it, you already have some degree of chaos. But later on, the orbit becomes stable again. So this equatorial orbit that is here, moves here. In fact, if you check carefully this model, the 
equipotential lines, you can see that there are also two other periodic orbits, and all of them are joining to one family after a critical energy which is about 0 0.55. But anyway, for the central family, what happens is that you have infinitely many transitions from stability to instability and vice versa. And in this scenario, there is a theory that is well known that establishes that there are, well, in quote unquote, universal ratios. So we don't have the value 8 point something like in the period doubling scenario, but we have a value which is given by a universal law, which is different from system to system, but is still given by a universal law. And this law was discovered by Hagee something like 30 years ago, and the law says that the bifurcation interval, the intervals, the successive intervals, tend to a ratio which depends on the second derivatives of the potential at the central point. If you compute this ratio, this gives something like 15.19 for our particular system. And if you uh, compute the stability intervals numerically, you find that it is quite nice. And here, in the sixth transition, we already have 15.18. So that theory works very well. Well, the essential thing is that uh, uh, after all, the orbits become chaotic and the, 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 invariant, the adiabatic invariants are destroyed altogether. And you can have escapes, well, we call them escapes, of orbits from various channels. Essentially, here you have these channels, but these channels actually uh, never have an escape because asymptotically the, the neck of the bottle becomes so small that you always return within your domain. But this return time can become very long, so you can speak about effective escapes. If you compute the dynamics of these escapes, the color plots here indicate times of escape essentially, or a number of returns that you need to come back and so on you see that essentially they follow manifold dynamics. So the, the, stat, the, the distribution of the escaping times, essentially, in this plot, follow the stable and the unstable. Actually, the distribution of the regardless times follow the stable manifolds of the central periodic orbit that has become unstable. So this is, uh, let's say, as a nice uh, Come, coming out of conclusion from this study that shows not only the limits of applicability of the normal theory, but also a little what happens beyond. And I reach the conclusions. Well, uh, I, I concentrate here the new things, the things that, let's say, our group has done in this study. First of all, the classical adiabatic invariants of magnetic bottles computed to a high normalization order. And this gives very precise values. I gave some figures for that. Uh, computation of the mirror frequency, also to a high precision. Computation of the bifurcation energies for the resonances. And of course, one can always reveal, if one goes high enough to perturbation theory, the asymptotic character of this series. Now, resonant adiabatic invariants you first have to compute the non-resonant series in order to be able to do these constructs. You have to re-engineer your Hamiltonian by combining these techniques that we call bookkeeping and tuning. And this allows to obtain very satisfactory the phase portraits in the neighborhood of resonances. And also to predict eventually the critical energy when we have a global onset of chaos. And we ended with showing that this global chaos regime is related very much to money from dynamics. So I think this is more or less. Thank you for the attention. Thank you, Christos.